and when someone displays intent, it's it's through uh, physicality, you know. So this is something that you're only going to be able to observe visually. So the stimulus in the training environment is audible. The stimulus in the real world is visual. So when you go into a, a scenario-based force-on-force training environment, you're, you now have that visual stimulus combined with the, the audible that, that's going on there. So you're making real-world decisions in real-world time. And it's really not even decision-making. At this point, it becomes re- reflexive action. Welcome to the Firearms Nation podcast. And we are here again with another interview from somebody who is within the firearms world. Uh, he's, you know, actually met him, and we'll talk about that a, a while ago. And, you know, always in the back of my mind, I kind of wanted to bring him on the show just to discuss his background, what he does. And uh, I've noticed in the past couple of years, he uh, has been working on writing books. So he, he wrote some books. He's, he's involved in uh, the security business and executive production. And he's also a, a friend of a friend of the podcast, uh, Wayne Black. So uh, I'm going to bring him on, and uh, we have an interesting conversation ahead. So, uh, Don, uh, thank you for uh, coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. And for those of you that don't know, it's uh, Don Reddle, and uh, his uh, company is Executive Options. And uh, well, let's just start with that. What what is Executive Options? We are a private investigation agency, and we're in the state of Florida. Within the agency, of course, we do investigations. We do a lot of security consulting, threat assessments, vulnerability assessments, executive protection, uh, and of course, training, firearms training and advanced level training. And what what type of clients uh, do you work with? How do do, uh, people uh, find you? I'd say uh, we, we have an open enrollment schedule, but open enrollment is kind of a, on the smaller side of the courses that we're doing. A lot of our stuff is client-based these days. So it's executive protection companies, uh, private private um, companies that have their own executive protection teams, school security forces, you know, clients like that. So how, how did you get into this business? Because you've been doing it for a long time. You know, I uh, you know, doing research for the show, I, you know, I did some, uh, digging and yeah, you've been doing it for, for a while. And my journey started back in the, uh, the early nineties. I was living in New York. I was a, um, competitive pistol shooter and not only on, on the competition side, we didn't really take it that serious. We'd shoot the local IDP, uh, excuse me, IPSC matches and things like that. The local gun club, we had an action league that we'd shoot in weekly, kind of predated even IDPA. And I was good. I would always win matches. I'd, I'd win or be in the top two or three of anything I competed in. Became an NRA instructor and um, just really took more of an interest in, in the defensive side of the handgun as opposed to using it for a competition. So anyways, about that same time, New York State implemented the security guard training program. Because prior to that, it was there was no licensing at all. Anybody could work security in any capacity. So they instituted a training program for armed and unarmed guards. In order to become an instructor, you had to go to the NRA Law Enforcement Firearms Instructor School. So I was interested in doing that, and I did that and started teaching those courses. And the interesting thing was, was if you were a young kid at a department store watching the security monitor, or if you were the detail leader of a Fortune 100 executive protection team in New York City, you had to take the same training classes by New York State. It was across the board. So doing these classes, I, I met a lot of people at very high levels in the executive protection industry. And I took an interest in that. I actually went down to the D.C. area, took a few executive protection training classes from um, you know high level former Secret Service type people. And I got into the industry as a contractor. Worked for a long time as a contractor. First, it was at back at that time, the industry wasn't as crowded as it is today. There was only a small handful of big companies doing all the work throughout the United States. So I was able to get in with these companies and work at a, a fairly high level throughout the, the uh, United States for some very large, you know, Fortune 100, 500 companies. Um, then I got into, I met some high net worth families we did some work for throughout the Florida area. 
I think it was around 2003 is when I moved down to Florida, opened my own company, trying to kind of get away from the contracting work and have my old my old firm and people working for me. And uh, so we were doing that, and we were also doing training about you know all throughout the same time period. So it was always uh, always something to keep us busy. That's for sure. Now I don't know if you remember, uh, but I met you. Uh, at a Greg Hamilton class down here in South Florida, and uh, it was it was me, uh, another guy from my agency, uh, Hilton Yam, who uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ten Eight Performance. Um, I think Wayne was in that class. Wayne Black, uh, our friend Shy was in that class. Sure. And uh, that was you know that was pre me becoming a uh, firearms instructor. This is when I started to get into. Uh, there's a whole training component that I never had an experience with that I started to go to and started to see what was out there. Uh, but so do you remember that? I do. It was, uh, that was actually fun. That was out at that private range yes. out there. Everglades. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. That was, it was a great class. Uh, learned a lot. And to this day, I'm thinking that's gotta be, I want to say maybe 2008, 2009 would, would yeah. make the most sense. Yeah, at the latest, sure, sure. So there was some stuff that, you know, and I haven't kept up with Greg. I don't know if he's still teaching. I think his company was Insights Training. Uh, but how, so how did you, I mean, he, he taught some great stuff and he's like a, a former, I think he was your SF or, or Ranger, but he was also a competitive shooter. And mm-hmm. I started to see that whole connection between uh, people who are really good in the tactical world also had a competitive side and that started me down that road. But but how did you get up with uh, uh, Greg Hamilton? How did you get into that class? I met Greg and uh, John Holshin and some other you know very high level people at the National Tactical Invitation. In fact, the first one I went to was in Pennsylvania, nineteen ninety five, nineteen ninety six. When I went to Gunsight, it was called the NTI National Tactical Invitational. Is when I when I met those guys out there, and uh, we just became fast friends. And actually, the the, uh, the NTI was my very first introduction to force on force training, so that was where I kind of got the bug on that. And I, I seem to recall, and I, I might be wrong, but I seem to recall, uh, were, were you shooting in nineteen? There was someone in the class that was the very first time I ever shot a nineteen eleven, and I couldn't believe how amazing it was because I was like hitting targets at hundred, you still targets at hundred yards. Was it was that you or was that somebody else? I was probably shy. Because I know when I came to Florida, I was shooting a SIG T26. In fact, okay. uh, I still have that that gun because that's the gun that I won the NTI with. So that's like the only gun in my safe that has a little bit of a you know an emotional attachment. Everything else are guns that I use. But um, I know I was shooting the SIG when I came down here. Okay, I know Sh- that's right. Sh- I was shooting a 1911 9mm and uh, hard to beat. It was really hard to always chasing shot <laughs> he beat him yes that's that, that was that was a thing uh very impressive uh but so you know you got that the shooting the the 226 and everything like that you, you got that at the nti what you know we're in an instagram instagram world now where everything is just like these new and i've never heard of the nti what 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 is the nti because it sounds fascinating the uh, tactical invitational i mean who wouldn't want to go to that it was great. It doesn't exist anymore. I think it's kind of been replaced by the uh, TACCON, Tactical Conference. Tom Gibbons kind of is, is doing something along that lines now. But um, the National Tactical Invitational was held in Pennsylvania normally. There was one time it was at gun site. Uh, you had to get an invitation to go. It was filled with a thumb. It wasn't exactly a competition so much as it was meant to interact with other people and learn and, and share information. You know, you you want to come out at the end of that week better than when you went in. There was a lot of people there that donated their time to put the event on. And also instructors would come in from all over the country to donate blocks of instruction. And um, it was good. About half of the event was live fire and the other half was force on force scenarios. They had a village set up with all different types of scenarios, you know, get robbed at the gas pump, getting uh, having to go to court, all, all different types of things. And at the time, it was way ahead of its time. There wasn't really any place else 
in the country that was doing what they were doing. So it was um, it was really a privilege and, and an honor to be able to go there and participate. And in 1999, it was the year that I won it. Well, and congrats to that. Thank you. Uh, when was it for you that you uh, kind of picked up that competition was the way to go in terms of uh, shooting technique? Well, competition shooting for me was always a way to just kind of find out what's going to work with, um, you know, always trying to improve my skill level, of course, and, you know, uh, equipment, see what works, what didn't work, you know, and and put it into a, um, I guess, an, an environment or a situation where we can test test for ourselves and test our gear. But that started early on. That was back in the, in the, in the early 90s, early to mid 90s is when I really started pushing myself. And did, did you stick with it? Are you still doing competition or has that gone by the wayside? I had a legitimate competition in quite a while. Uh, when I get back to New York, I still like to head down to that same league on Tuesday nights. It was been going on since the 90s with the, the same, almost the same group of people. So it's fun. I get to the range and push myself or I'll go with a couple of different friends of mine and uh, just push ourselves. But as far as legit competition, it, it's been a little while. I probably shouldn't get back into it because I've met the nicest people in the world that, you know, will remain friends forever, a lot of it through competitive shooting. Well, you, you made the right decision early on by, I mean, I did the same thing. I came down, when when did you come down from New York to Florida? 2003 was when I first came down. Okay. I uh, We moved down in 2002. So okay. uh, you, made, you made the right decision uh, ahead of all, everybody else now who is moving down here uh, from or a lot from New York, but from other places in the country as well. Uh, but Florida, you know, has, has definitely grown in, in terms of its uh, shooting ranges and competition and everything. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you can find a match pretty much anywhere now in the state of Florida, some really good matches if uh, that's something you want to do. Yeah, for sure. In fact, the, recently I was looking up different matches near where I live, different, different clubs, so... Well, one other thing I just want to talk about your background. You said you're you're in uh, executive protection, and you know uh, that always, of course, brings a lot of uh, you know questions. Like you, you see stuff in the movies, uh, you know, like like the bodyguard or some of these other Secret Service style things, where uh, it seems uh, very glamorous. But I always think of there was a older movie, which is a great movie, uh, To Live and Die in L.A where you're basically standing by a door pretty much the whole time. It's it's not so glamorous. Uh, so is that the kind of executive protection that, that you're doing? Well, when it comes to real executive protection, what somebody else sees is really the finished product of what we're doing. So let's say if we're going to spend 24 hours with a, a, a given client at a given location, we're going to spend three or four days doing all our advanced work, which is our planning, logistics, identifying potential threats, actual threats, and we don't identify them so we can engage with them. We identify them so we can not be there. We can go the other way. You know, it's our, our it's really our job to avoid and evade anything that can be a, a potential threat, whether it's a, you know, a, a human threat, environmental threat, or, you know, just something that could become come by chance. And we want to identify all these things and not be there. It's, um, there's, there's, you know, we're not out there looking for fights. We're looking for, you know, to not, not be a fight. So um, what people see it is, is the kind of the final product. Now, obviously, you know, you've been doing this for a long time and it's your company. So I, you're not out there uh, spending long hours standing by a door anymore, but you've got people working for you. Uh, right. How many people do you have in your company? Well, <laughs> every time I say that, I find myself on a plane or doing a 16 hour shift somewhere. So I got to be careful when I say, I'll say, uh, yeah, I don't travel much anymore. The next thing you know, my phone rings and I'm on my way to Mexico or something to work 16 hour shifts. And so, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, in, in a perfect world, it would be me just having other people out there working, but that's really not the real world. You know, I've got uh, a handful of people of my core group that I rely on as contractors. If something comes in, but in, in the United States, there's not a lot of executive protection where you have four, six, or seven-man details. It just it just doesn't exist. 
In fact, some of the most high profile details or details for the biggest companies in the world that I work for are very, very uh, money conscious. So we've been actually, if you get two people on a, a detail, that, that's a luxury a lot of times in today's world. So it's, um, it's long hours. It's um, very little sleep. It, it, there's, there's not a lot of glamour. You know, it's not all private jets and staying at the Four Seasons, but um, every now and then, but not not always. If you can, and you know the the contracts are over and there's plenty of time, but if you can, can you tell a story of probably the I want to say the coolest, but the most interesting uh, detail that that you've ever done? The most interesting those you, you know. That's a good question. I have to be careful because I really can't discuss, you know, clients and who they are. But I, I did handle a protection detail for our friend Wayne Black. Um, he had a client that when he came to New York City, I would, I would handle, you know, that that end of it when I was in New York. And he was just a wonderful, wonderful guy. It was just a pleasure to be around. Um, and those are always nice experiences because not everybody you work for really interacts with you or, or treats you as an, you know, as a, as a human. I mean, I've had people that are really disrespectful just because they, they, they want to be, or they can be, but it's nice when you have a nice, a nice client that treats you with respect that it really, you know, takes an interest in, in you as well, which is very rare, but, um, they've had some celebrity clients that were, were nice people, some that were not, um, most clients really, don't interact with us. They're we're just a tool. We're just doing a job. It's and it's we're a tool that they can dispose of and, and get a new one if they're unhappy with it. So it's not um, you're not out there. You're, you're not part of the the group. You, you, you know what I mean? If you're, you're if you're covering a celebrity, you're not part of the celebrity's entourage. You're just doing your job. If you can again. Because uh, I find this fascinating, and I'm sure other people do too, because they're probably thinking, I want to get into this line of work. But what was your most tense and scary, uh, you don't have to give out the names of what it was, but uh, situations in all your many years of doing this? Uh, most tense. I had a, um, a shareholders meeting I was working for for a, uh, a very large, large company. And it was a, um, a job I was handling. There was two of us, and there probably should have been six of us. The CEO was uh, kind of mingling beforehand. You know, for people that don't know about you know corporate shareholder meetings, if you buy one share of stock, you can have access to, to the uh, the shareholders meeting. So pretty much, if someone has a um, an axe to grind, or if they're if they're a threat, if they have something that, that they want to accomplish, they can buy one share of stock, and they they can get into the room. You can't keep them out. So. In situations like that, well, we're not doing metal detectors and access control is kind of limited. It's um, I'm, this be one particular uh, job I was worried there was only a couple of us and there should have been probably four or at least six of us. So the tension tore up. People are getting close. One guy got kind of angry. We had to get in there and you know kind of get between them. And there's cameras everywhere, so you have to be very careful how you how you handle yourself. So you just have to. We just you know calmly got in between our threat and the um the, the threat and our principal and, and kind of moved them away nice and easily but um actually there was one now that i remember the um we had a client contact us we we're in new york from miami whose daughter was dating somebody who was not who we said he was you know he was much older he had a criminal history he had a, a lot of bad stuff and the daughter didn't know it, it was a cute little girl young girl in her 20s he was in his 40s so then she was ready to break up with him but the mother was scared she's in miami she wanted us to be there for the breakup so we actually went uh down to the city picked her up took her to a public place and he had no idea that we were there and uh she really she she turned it on really good she held herself in good composure outside environment broke up with the guy and off she goes she walks away and I was sitting at the next table and I'm just watching the guy and he was just kind of sitting there. He was in disbelief and he gets up and he goes after her. And I was like, um, oh, thought this was over. I thought we solved it. So of course I followed 
he grabs her, corrals her, starts with the finger in the face and called her name, is trying to control her. So at that point, I stepped in between the um, our girl that we're protecting and the bad guy, the, uh, the boyfriend. And I covered and evacuated her like I would a principal in danger. And my partner came in and read the guy the riot act. And he was in disbelief. He had no idea that the two of us were there. And within a blink of an eye, I had scooped her up and moved her on. And my partner was explaining to this guy that the relationship was over. And he had to now convince us that he wasn't going to contact her again. So that was that was interesting. That's really not an executive protection job, but it's a uh, it was it was it, it was different. You know, it's oh, it one sounds of the, cool. Yeah, I mean, you you never know when you're you're out there who's who's doing what. You know, that's that's the whole undercover aspect of it. Because uh, yeah, you definitely have the you know you can see people when they get out of the limo. The guys in the suits pretty much are going to be, you know, their protection detail. Uh, just real quick, if someone's interested in in pursuing this line of work, what, what do you think is the best course of action for them to get hmm. into a, a position where they would be working with you? Uh, networking is really good. If someone wants to get into the business, go get some good professional training. Um, R.L. Oatman down in the D.C. area, he's uh, he runs a great executive protection tra- uh, training program. Vehicle Dynamics Institute is is great for executive protection driving, probably the best in the country, if not the world. And medical training. You know, learn how to do EP, not the shooting stuff. Learn how to do the, the nuts and bolts, the advanced work, the logistics, how to plan, what the business is really all about. Learn how to drive. You're going to spend a lot more time behind the wheel than you are of the, a gun. And then um, learn medical stuff, you know, how to stop, stop bleeding, stop the bleed classes, you know, advanced, advanced um, hemorrhage control classes. Those are really the key elements. And then network, get out there and meet people. That's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Not going to conferences and stuff like that. Not, not like hanging out at bars. No, no, no different conferences. And then there are some, you know, there's a, a group now that is trying to, uh, create a standard for executive protection across the board. Because back way back when I started in this business, there wasn't a lot of people. It was it was a small group of us working all over the country. So I'm, you know, one of the benefits for me being in the business this long is that a lot of the people that I worked with back in the day are the same people that I rely now on as as contractors or contacts and. The, Everyone's all over the country. So if someone was to reach out to me, hey, I need something and done in Dallas or Chicago or state of Washington, it, it's it's no problem. It's a phone call for me and it's not to an unknown. It's to someone that I've known for 20 years. So that that's kind of a, a how a good thing that it worked out for me. But what's happened over the years is that this this uh this whole industry has become very crowded. There's a ton more people in it than it used to be. So, of course, when that happens, the standards go down, people get in, and I'm not trying to be disparaging to anybody, but it's like anything else, you know, it gets watered down. So, um, anyways, there's one group out there now, and I forget who it is with their, I know some some of my friends are involved, and they're, um, they're trying to form a standard, create a standard, that because uh, there's no real licensing for executive protection that's nationwide, but some in- industry standard that you have to uh, hold yourself up to, so that's kind of a good thing as well. You've written several books in the past uh, five, six years, uh, Get Off the X, Fighting Handgun, and then more recently, uh, last year, Force on Force. Uh, for, for people who don't know, and we're going to focus on Force on Force because it's an interesting topic, but for people who don't know, what is Force on Force? Um, force on Force training is scenario-based training. And it's, it's a really powerful tool that you can use to teach or test the you know, skills and abilities. So um, when we say force on force, we're actually using force against each other in a controlled scenario-based environment. So you have to wear protective gear, helmets, and, and padding, and groin protection. And it's, um, it is, it's really a powerful training tool where People go into a, uh, a scenario-based environment and they have to interact with other people. And the difference is when you're training with weapons, you're usually on a square range. And what you're doing is you're taking all, all of the things that you're doing, whether it's going to be a, you know, a defensive handgun training class or if it's a competitive shooting match, 
you're pretty much always responding to something that's an auto hold. You know, in a competitive match, or it's going to be a shot timer in a, uh, a training environment or something with an instructor, you're receiving instruction. You're being told what to do when, and when to do it. So it's all audible. And in the real world, when it comes to using force against somebody else in a, in a you know, lawful use of force, it's really based on the intent of the other person. You know, the ability, the opportunity and jeopardy, and then they have to display an intent before you have, you, you'd be lawfully, you know, allowed to use force against another person. And when someone displays intent, it's, it's through uh, physicality, you know, so this is something that you're only going to be able to observe visually. So the stimulus in a training environment is audible. The stimulus in the real world is visual. So when you go into a, a scenario-based force-on-force training environment, you're, you now have that visual stimulus combined with the, the audible that, that's going on there. So you're making real-world decisions in real-world time. And it's really not even decision-making. At this point, it becomes re reflexive action. So it's a, it's a real powerful medium that we can use to test skills and abilities, or we can also use it to teach skills and abilities. It's um, for people that haven't done it, you know, it, it's an eye opener. Well, I'd like to to add to that. Um, so, in in law enforcement, we use force on force a lot in in our training exercises, and uh, it's 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 different than paintball. You're you're shooting, I guess, the the largest. One out there would be simunitions, if people have heard that. Uh, so you're using simunitions, and these things, I think, are going at 400, 450 feet per second. And it's a marking cartridge, but it, it hurts. It definitely hurts, and there's safety protocols that have to go into place. But you're doing these scenarios, and your adrenaline definitely goes up. And look, at, from, from experiencing it myself to being a, an instructor in the exercise and seeing how... Uh, things break down in these exercises, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, uh, I think simulations were around 350, 400 uh, feet per second. So it's, it, it, it is going to sting you. Um, what, one thing that we always do when we promote these classes or talk to people, we, we say, listen, in our, our training, we don't beat people up. We build them up. You know, the, there's a big difference because when someone is learning something, you know, let's say it's as very basic as the, how to draw the gun, present it, and then return it to the holster. Before they get that down and they're able to do that reflexively without conscious thought, it may take a thousand repetitions for them to be able to access and do that skill on demand. So with force on force, we can almost take and circumvent that process. You know, the, the, the process starts by new things that you learn, get put into your, uh, your short-term memory. And as you do them over and over and over again, that gets consolidated into your long-term memory storage. Therefore, you don't really have to um, have any conscious thought at this point. That's when things become reflexive. So one way we can circumvent that long, tedious process of doing all those repetitions is through a powerful learning experience with force on force. Now, let's say, for example, how many times do you have to touch a hot stove before you learn never to do it again, right? Just once, because it's that powerful emotional experience and the pain that comes with it, so you'll never do it again. You get rid of all those other 999 times that you would have to do that repetition. And it's the same thing with force on force. We bring someone into a class and they come out of the back end of a scenario the victor they won they were able to see feel and and you know understand everything that they were doing in real time and and come out a winner they can kind of get past having to do those things over and over and over because now we've solidified that experience into the long term memory storage and on the flip side if you give someone a powerful negative emotional experience you may never have success with that person let's say for example you get a new police recruit and he goes into a scenario, and it's the SWAT team guys in there that are playing the bad guys. And they light him up and just kill him. And he goes home defeated. That really could have a negative effect on somebody. So, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's what goes on. I'm just using that as a what-if type of example. So you have to be really careful how you use this powerful tool because 
if you use it the wrong way, you're not helping people. And you've got to use it so you can have them come out a better shooter, a better person, a better tactician in the end. So um, we oftentimes people will think that uh, force on force training is an advanced level training, that it's only for people that are really, you know, at the top of their game. And I say it's really not. You can use force on force training at any level. Because we, when you do a, uh, a teaching scenario, you have the ability to run that scenario at an intensity level that is going to be, you know, what that particular student needs. So we can run a low intensity scenario, and if things, if the, the student is having some issues, we can pause the scenario. We can, you know, discuss what's going on. What do you see? What do you not see? What are you doing, and why? If they after they understand it, we can restart the scenario and have them take it right through the end. And this way, it was a learning tool as opposed to beating them up. So, and then, of course, you get, you know, high-speed SWAT guys. You can have them go into a scenario, and, you know, if they win, they win. If they don't, they don't, because in the end, they're going to just have to, you know, put leave their ego at the door and do a debrief and find out what they did wrong. Okay, great, accept it. Now go do it again and do it right. You know, so it all depends who, who the student is how you approach the the, uh, the training. So one of the things, you know, you're, you're a force on force instructor, you're certified, uh, you've got a wealth of knowledge. So I want to pick your brain just a little bit because these are questions that I always had as an instructor uh, in these types of environments. So one of the things that I felt was, it was necessary, but it's a drawback to a lot of students is when you put that mask on, so as soon as they put the mask on, if we want to teach people, say on traffic stops, and obviously we've we've got the the simunition guns uh, for a point, but we're not using it every time. But when they're putting those masks on, automatically they're thinking it's going to be a gunfight. Even when sometimes we just wanted them to, it's just a regular traffic stop. Not every traffic stop is going to be a, a, a shootout, you know, LA style shootout. It's just going to be you're writing the ticket. But we have to have this on because we, we would rotate the different scenarios. But automatically, everybody thought it was a gun gunfight. They get out, they act that way too, that, you know, they have their guns drawn or whatever. I'm like, dude, why are you, why are you drawing your gun on me? I'm, I'm just here driving my car, you know? It's just, so there's no way to get around that. There, there's just, unless you have an idea, there's just no way. You know, we were looking at Airsoft, but Airsoft was just different. And then those BBs just go everywhere because uh, we just think maybe they could wear eye protection. Yeah. So now that I have someone who's instructor, certified general dynamics, the whole nine yard, what what would be your answer to that? Well, it's it's really just being able to do a mix of scenarios where not every scenario always is a, a shooting scenario. Um, I I believe in the simunition safety equipment. There's some other good stuff out there, but the simunition stuff is the best. It's a little bit bulkier than some of the other other stuff, but. The, you know, the trade-off is it's better, it's safer. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the expert witness stuff that, I, that I've that i done on some injury cases, and it, it's a big part of it. But one scenario that we typically do is we'll have a, um, a guide in ATM, ATM machine. Uh, and, you know, it's funny, you'll get students, okay, listen, you have to go up to the ATM and get your money, and there's a guy already standing at the ATM, of course, one of our role players. Uh, I never go to the ATM. Well, Today you have to go to the ATN because it's it's part of the learning experience. But um, anyways, we'll have the guy turn around real quickly and, and abruptly reach into his back pocket real quick and come up with a roadmap, like in, in a you know blink of an eye. And um, sometimes it gets drawn, guns get drawn on them. Sometimes you get shot. Sometimes people get off the line of force, create a little bit of distance, and you know get their hands up in the ready position and and you know perform it as they should. But um, it's it's interesting to see, and then when somebody is typically will video the stuff and let the student watch the the video afterwards, so they can see themselves from a third the third party perspective, and they can see what what they were doing and why and how, and um, then you can kind of see it. They'll they'll get it in their eyes. You, you can see it in someone's eyes when they realize, okay, now I get it. Now now I understand what I sh what I should have done instead of just going to guns. You know, it's uh. One of the guys that I, I've been training with, with uh, forever said, "What the uh, threat level goes up, the first weapon you reach for is your brain. 
you know, and that's always, uh, it, it was, it, that's kind of stayed with us. So we see that all the time. And then when you put people in, in scenarios when, when it's not a shooting scenario and they start, they start to come back down to reality. So it's, it's not really equipment based, it's experience based. How, how do, uh, everyday citizens get this type of force on force training? Cause I know it's, it's prevalent in so many law enforcement, uh, departments. Uh, it's probably being used in some way or another in the military. Um, I did a, uh, uh, TCCC certification course with the army and, uh, as, as law enforcement, but they opened it up to us and yeah, they were using, we used the, for the whole scenario, we were using, uh, some munition gear, but how do everyday people get that type of experience? Well, it's out there. We're doing it. Uh, if you go to like Simunitions website based on where somebody lives, they have a list of instructors or, or schools that are, that are teaching civilians on their site, people that are certified through them. Uh, we're on there, of course. But um, the the downside is for the average person just to go to a simulation uh, training course, it's expensive. You know, to put one on, the, you know, you're looking at probably, I think it's 60, 70 cents a round right now for the force on force ammo. The equipment, I mean, the, the average, if you're going to do a class, we, I think I've got 16 sets of gear. So I'm, it's got to be $20,000 worth of equipment to show up with. And it's, it's logistics heavy. The guns, I've got six of the Glock 17 T pistols, which are Glock pistols designed just for shooting uh, simulation. They're, they're not converted guns or dedicated guns. They cost more than real Glocks. So, you know, it's, it's, it's cost and, and logistics heavy to do these courses. So, um, but they're out there. Like we're, we're doing a one day class coming up. I think it's two hundred ninety nine dollars. It's uh, an advanced defensive handgun class, and it's a, it's actually day two of our fighting handgun class. But this particular range won't let us use the word fighting handgun. We have to call it advanced defensive handgun. But anyways, that's um, you know two two ninety nine for some people is is a little much for a one day class. You know, it's, um, but it all depends. No, it's, it's great training. It's stress inoculation. It puts you in a scenario. It's, it's very different than paintball. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, finding a place to do it, since you've done some expert witness on this, what are your thoughts? Uh, cause I, this occurred sometime in my past where, uh, we had a live range, uh, like a, a live fire range, uh, but for some of the training, they were also doing simunition training on the same range. Is is that a no go? Because uh, for me, from from my perspective, I thought you could have problems because you're you're doing dual things there. You're having live guns and you're having simunition guns. And yes, you're doing all the safety checks, but why not just have an area where you're just doing simunition so it's known to everybody that yeah, I'm not bringing on my backup gun. I'm not bringing up another gun. I'm just using the guns that they're giving me. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one or the other. If you're going to use a range for live fire training for a day, that's fine. But if it's going to be a force on force day, there's, there's no live guns at all. I mean, we even tell people don't, don't even bring it. One of the things I do in my, um, how we approach the safety is it's very redundant. You know, we have, um, the very first thing I do is I'll email everybody a copy of the force on force safety brief before the class. And it'll tell them not to bring anything live or lethal to the class and why. It's basically everything that we're going to go over that day. And the first thing I do when I do the safety brief in the morning is a whole, I'll take out a box of ammunition and fumble around trying to open it. Say, hey, does anybody have a knife? And of course, nobody does. I've never had anybody have a knife, but it just kind of sets the tone and, you know, and it, it lets people know this is how serious we are. But um, everybody goes through for us, of course, the, the, training environment is sterilized and we we check it for you know not even one loose round anywhere and then it's secured so then everyone does a self-check everyone has the the chance to check their pockets check you know check everything and make sure they don't have anything live or leaf law great then they do a buddy check they pair off with somebody else and they check each other and then we do an instructor check so before anyone goes into the training environment or any weapons or fx ammunition are issued we do an instructor check, which is basically a pat down like your law enforcement search. 
And then when that's done, so we've got a triple redundancy on range day, and then we're able to participate in training and, you know, start the training. Um, when we break for lunch, when we come back, it all starts over again, you know, because a lot of times, especially if you're training law enforcement guys, they'll gear up, they'll go out to lunch and come back. And historically, most training accidents happen after lunch because people come back and they're, you know, they've got a nice full belly and they forgot they threw their ankle gun on or something like that. And, you know, bad things happen when you put safety second. And there's lots of case history on this. We have one right here in, in Florida, not too long ago, in Miami, where that happened. Yeah, I would say every year uh, there is going, unfortunately, but it seems like there's always a train accident where someone ends up getting shot and killed with a, with a live round when there shouldn't have been any live round. You know, the, the instructor shot the guy in the chest demonstrating something and... It wasn't a sim gun. It wasn't a blue gun. It was a real gun. Um, or someone, you know, has whatever, uh, an accidental discharge or negligent discharge on the range and it hits the, the guy next to him. So, I mean, train accidents happen every year. So that's something you said you're, you're an expert witness and you, and you deal with a lot of these cases. Yeah. One thing, uh, before I hit that, I'll, I'll back it up. We don't just do force on force training. We'll do force on target training as well. Uh, force on target is using the force on force stuff, the sing ignition guns and sing ignition ammo to do things against inanimate targets, not just not just other people. So if we're teaching contact distance shooting or, or close quarter shooting where you know, you're holding a gun in, in, in nice tight you know, circumstances or doing different things that um, is new to somebody. It may not really be unsafe, but it's new. So it's just easier because you're still shooting a projectile. You still have a, a Glock pistol. You're still going to you know, hit the target with the projectile, but there's no risk of injury or death if somebody makes a mistake. When we're teaching, say, a two-man team to go through a door together, how to pie the corners, or one guy goes in first, the other guy goes in the other way, or if they're stacked up to go through a door, a doorway. Um, we would want to make sure that we're doing that with the force on target guns because this way if, if someone has an negligent discharge and they, and they shoot the guy in front of them in the foot or, or the the rear end or something like that it's not going to be a, a good experience for the guy getting shot he's probably going to be a little upset about that but he's going all you know so until we can really work on these things over and over and over even if someone's going through a, a door and they're the guy behind the guy in front of them and they don't shoot them but they're flagging them with the muzzle. We can show them, listen, you're pointing the gun at the guy in front of you. you have, you're you able to teach them in an environment that, you know, we don't have a real gun with real bullets in there with the, the potential for a tragedy. We're eliminating that. So the force on target application works really well for us as well. But I didn't, I didn't mean to get sidetracked on you. What was your question about the... Uh, no, we were talking about train accidents that, that occur, uh, and you've now uh, become an expert witness, and you're, you're testifying in cases uh, of accidental death or injury? Yeah, the last couple cases, we, uh, we didn't, they didn't even have to testify because there was just so much overwhelming uh, evidence of, of negligence. Then we, we, wrote, we wrote the report, and he wanted to keep us as far away from the courtroom as they, they possibly could. But uh, most recently, we had a guy in an airsoft injury case where um, they allowed him to use his prescription eyeglasses as safety glasses. You know, there was no eye protection, no no simunition style helmet, no nothing. Um, and there's protocol when when you're going to start and, and run any type of force on force match. The safety people that are you know the safety instructors, the the safety officers are always going to double and triple check to make sure everyone's ready before you start any scenario. This particular place did not do that. They started the scenario without warning. The guy didn't even, he had nothing on for protection, just his prescription glasses. Another guy comes in the room, shoots him, boom, right in his eye. So now you got a guy who's in early 20s blind in one eye for the rest of his life. So, and there was a lot more going on there. You know, that's just like the, the quick version. But there was a lot of things that were, were just not done at all. Not, they, not that they were done improperly. They just weren't enforced or done to begin with. 
So we've seen that. Um, we had a law enforcement one, believe it or not, where they didn't have enough safety equipment for everybody, so they made it optional. <laughs> if you can believe that, they made it optional. And um female officer got shot in the face, like through the eye area up and damaged her nasal cavity and got lodged up behind her eye. So she had to go through several surgeries and it was um it, it was pretty ugly. That one settled that accord as well. But um yeah, it's um and it's always the same thing. It's always not enforcing proper safety protocol or you know being lax. It's either lax safety protocol or non-existent safety protocol. Those are is pretty much the the common denominator to everything that we're seeing. Uh, so, for a point of reference, prescription glasses are not considered safety glasses, and that's just for everybody out there. We're going to be doing these types of airsoft, uh, you know, simulation training. Uh, can't use your prescription glasses. Right. It's full head, face, and neck protection. So everything from here up is is covered. Um, there's the old paintball masks that just kind of come around and cover the front of your face, but they're leaving your forehead exposed, your ears exposed, all your, your soft skin back here exposed, your, your jaw lines exposed. Um, teeth injuries are one of the big ones that we see with um, airsoft games because people are covering their teeth. And those little BBs, the difference between an airsoft BB and a simunition projectile is that the airsoft BB, even though it's plastic, it's hard. It, it's, it's, you know, it's not going to give it all. A uh, force-on-force projectile, when it hits its intended target, it collapses. It crushes. It's plastic and it crushes. And it does two things. One, the, uh, the marking material that's inside, it's like dish soap, squirts out onto the, the target so you can see where your hit was. And a lot also dissipates a lot of the energy as opposed to going taking all that energy and going into the target that it hits. Whereas the airsoft BBs, it's not collapsing at all. So 100% of that, that kinetic energy is going into whatever it hits. So if your mouth is not covered, there's a lot of uh, dental injuries that are, that are taking place. You can do a quick Google search and look for, you know, airsoft teeth injuries, and you'll see picture after picture. It never ends. Well, that sounds pretty horrible. I don't know if I want to see those pictures. Uh, so, yeah, so these cases end up, there's there was just something lax in, in their protocol. Um, and that's tough because I know to get the buy-in from a lot of people, uh, they don't want to be discomforted by wearing all that stuff. Now, you know, I've been, uh, a lot of times, I was always the bad guy uh, for these training exercises, and I had the full-on suit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, a, it's really hot, it's, and then you have this, this helmet thing on. Uh, I felt very protected, that's for sure, but it's definitely uncomfortable, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy the amount of padding that you're wearing. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people, that's why they wear those uh, paintball-style masks. Uh, because it's a little bit, you can breathe a little bit more because th- that was the other problem with a lot of times I've been in classes, they fog up and then people go crazy. I can't see my, you know, my gun, I can't see the target and then they end up getting hit and then they're just pissed off about the whole thing. Yeah. It, they have anti-fog wipes that we wipe the helmets down with, but there, there's not a perfect solution. You know, it's, um, something's got to give, it, you know, and if it's, um, if you have to be a little bit uncomfortable, to uh, come out at the end of the, the scenario intact and hundred percent safe as you went in, then it's worth it. If someone's having a problem with the mask fogging up, you can stop the scenario, fix the fix the mask, restart it. You know, there there's ways to do it. It's not like there's um, you know, we have to do this immediately, and there there's no there's no time to waste. It, it, it can always get it done. So it's um, I don't know. I'm I'm always gonna to go to decide a safety as opposed to cutting corners. Of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, so obviously you're an instructor for it, but uh, you recommend uh, force on force as an augmented part of training for people who are interested uh, in being better in their tactics and in their shooting. I think that uh, if someone is serious about defensive shooting, you know, carrying a gun for self-defense, 
if force on force is not a part of your training program, then I would consider it to be an incomplete. You know, it's uh, it's basically the the equivalent of someone who's a boxer or a martial artist always going to the the gym and hitting the bag and being the the best you know the best on, that there is on, on the punching bag that there ever was, but never got in the ring to spar with anybody. You know what I mean? It's like they they've never really been in there real time to have you know the force on force component of say a martial arts or a boxing match. Your force on force would be the other guy who's trying to punch you as well. So you can be the best the best there is using all the martial arts and boxing equipment, you know, with, with the bags and devices and stuff like that. But until you're out there dealing with another person trying to, to you know use his skills against you, it's it's the same thing. So you really need to have that final component and um you need to get it you need to go to someone who's going to use it to teach you not be up and they're out there you know if if people can't make it to a course that i'm doing if they w- want to contact me i'm happy to to point them in the right direction to other people that are doing you know really good stuff in the industry well that's that's a great segue into uh how do people reach out to you to talk to you about taking a class or hiring your uh executive protection or just wanting to say hi well, uh, my website for executive options is exopt-usa.com, and that's got all my uh, contact information on there. The uh, The training page will link you to the courses that we have coming up. So, right. yeah, re- reach out. I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Well, I'll, I, will, I will link that for those who are interested and didn't have a pen to write down that website as you're driving, listening to this show. Uh, it'll be in the show notes, so you can click on that. Uh, I'll also link his books uh, if you're interested in learning more about Force on Force and some of his ideas on on shooting. Uh, they'll be there as well. Uh, but I, I found it interesting. Uh, this, I think you're the the first person I've talked to in all these years um, that is, you know, a, a Force on Force trainer. Uh, so it's it's fascinating. And I hope people reach out and do it because. Uh, like Don was talking, it is it is an important part of your your program. It it definitely because we can't go out there and get in a gunfight every day, but you can work on skills and with the right training and in the right uh, environment, it the stress level goes up and you you'll see things fall apart and what you need to work on for the next time you do it. So it's it's great stress inoculation. But yeah, the Don, stress was that we really didn't touch on a lot, but uh, I've seen people do things that. Um, you know, when, when it's, when it's reflexive, it, it, it's, it's amazing. You know, if we had more time, we can go into more and more stories about the, the things that I've seen on different scenarios. And it's, uh, it's, it's something else. Well, I, I totally appreciate you coming on the show and, uh, sharing a little bit of your, your knowledge and expertise, uh, to the listeners and viewers. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. You too.